le monde. C'est nous. Warring parties in Ethiopia on Wednesday concerted to a ceasefire aimed at ending the fighting that broke out in 2020 between the federal government forces and the Tigra forces, bracketed by the African Union mediation team, the choice was made with cheer from across Africa, heralding the start of a new dawn for the government of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and leaders of the Tigray region. This choice, if well implemented, will end a conflict that has killed thousands of people, displaced millions and created what is today known as a humanitarian crisis in the uh, northern uh, Ethiopia, precisely in the Tigray region. Speaking on Wednesday, Olusagon Obasanjo, former Nigerian president, who now works uh, to mediate conflicts across Africa said, and I quote, the two parties in the Ethiopian conflict have formally agreed to the cessation of the hostilities as well as a systematic, orderly, smooth and coordinated disarmament. According to reports, the deal allegedly calls for the full disarmament of Tigray's forces within 30 days, with leaders meeting within five days to sort details. Ethiopian forces will also take control of federal facilities and major infrastructure in the Tigray region. The parties agreed to stop all forms of conflict and hostile propaganda, calling Ethiopians within the country and without to support effort for lasting peace. The peace deal follows a week of uh, keen talks in uh, South Africa's uh, capital city, Johannesburg, well, which began on uh, the uh, 25th of October uh, 2022. However, even though uh, a peace deal has been signed, a uh, problematic to the uh, remains if all the parties will commit uh, to the peace deal, uh, the mechanism for implementing, and of course, the role of other uh, actors involved. What can ensure the sustainability of a peace deal or a truce signed by warring parties in uh, Ethiopia? Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this midweek or to this weekend edition of Echo Pardon of the program Views on the Continent on the Pan African Television Afric Media. Today, we have come to talk the development in Ethiopia. It should be noted that uh, for almost two years now, uh, Ethiopia has been battling a uh, um, conflict, uh, the government of Ethiopia has been battling armed um, conflict uh, in uh, the Tigray region and of course on Wednesday uh, these parties that log ahead or these warring parties after keen consultations in uh, Johannesburg South Africa uh, brokered by the African Union decided to put the differences aside and come to a compromise by signing a peace deal but today we are looking at how these parties can respect uh, uh, the uh, the peace deal to ensure that uh, total peace returns to Ethiopia. Uh, that is what we are looking at uh, today, uh, like we heard in the preamble. Uh, Africa welcomed with cheer uh, the announcement of this peace uh, deal, of the ceasefire between uh, the government of Ethiopia and the Tigrayan forces. What can we expect? Uh, what are the outcome? We already saw the outcome, but then how can this peace be sustainable to put an end to the fighting that has caused uh, 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 mayhem to the uh, uh, population in uh, Tigray and of course other parts of Ethiopia. Welcome ladies and gentlemen and of course I'll go straight away uh, to uncovering the panel to discuss with us this day looking at uh, what can be done to sustain this peace deal, this ceasefire signed by warring parties uh, there in Ethiopia. It's a great milestone now. Uh, 
for the government of Ethiopia and of course uh, the uh, leaders of the Tigray region to have come to a compromise but then what can sustain this peace and of course we are going to meet uh, Mr. Elijah Enwako. He is a researcher with Lix University on African Development. He is joining us this day to give insight on this very important topic. Hello to you, sir, and a pleasure having you again. It's a pleasure having you, uh, Clarice, and uh, all the viewers of uh, Afric Media to uh, have a chat on this crudal and monumental a ceasefire that has happened in uh, the Horn of Africa and draw vital lessons for the rest of Africa that is going through conflicts. What can we draw from here? What can they do from here? So hopefully we're going to have a one hour fruitful discussion. Thanks for having me. This is actually an eye-opener for other countries across Africa facing the same. How can peace return to the continent Africa? And of course, and how can this peace be sustainable? Uh, some of the questions we are answering in the course of the program. And to Ghana, we're meeting for the first time uh, uh, Mr. Salifu Ali. He's the Executive Director, Africa Center for Development and Social Innovations. You are welcome to the Pan-African Television, Mr. Ali. Thank you so much, Clarice. And thank you one more time for inviting me to be on your panel and to share perspectives on how to sustain the peace, um, you know, the ceasefire that has been broken in Ethiopia. Um, I hope that within the one hour, you know, we're going to learn and share and to apply across Africa and see how we do better in terms of conflict management. So once again, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, this day, yeah, sharing your know-how, your expertise on uh, conflict resolution and why peace is a uh, prerequisite for development uh, across Africa, not only in Ethiopia. Before going now uh, in total into uh, the analysis, let's listen to this report uh, underlining uh, the peace deal uh, and of course that came as a result of the meeting uh, between stakeholders in South Africa, uh, brokered by the African Union. I'll join you right after that. The Ethiopian government and rebels from the northern Tigray province have agreed to a permanent cessation of hostilities. No one knows how many have died, but over two years of brutal war, the number is thought to be in the hundreds of thousands. It also unleashed a major humanitarian crisis. As far as both parts are concerned, we have made painful concessions because addressing the pains of our people is far more important than the kinds of concessions we have made. The war began in late 2020 after government forces invaded the region, accusing Tigrayan forces of rebellion. The African Union has welcomed the news as a new dawn, but the full text of the peace deal hasn't been released, with former Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta warning that the devil will be in the detail. For now, there are hopes that food aid can be resumed. According to the World Health Organization, 90% of people in the region need humanitarian assistance. And uh, that is how uh, that peace deal was reached between warring parties in uh, Ethiopia. What have you to see? What is your appraisal uh, regarding the latest development in Ethiopia? Starting uh, with you, uh, Mr. Elijah Inwako, uh, what's your appraisal uh, given the, the latest development of a truce in Ethiopia? Uh, we all know that it has been, uh, it's, it has been a tough road uh, trying to bring the parties together uh, and the negotiation table, but today uh, we are talking of a truce that has been paid down inked by these parties. So what's your own appraisal uh, about the latest development in Ethiopia? I will start by saying that this is a welcome piece of information from Africa. I'll start by congratulating Africans, say that the problems of Africa can be solved by Africans. We do not ask, expect African leaders to be jetting from all from Africa to North America here or to Europe to go and solve African problems. African problems can be solved in the African soil by Africans. So this is a welcome piece of information 
that shows that we can resolve a problem. That is the first thing. The second thing is the fact that we, you know, as Africans, at this point realize that the consequences of war are detrimental to the growth of Africans. And as long as people realize the consequences, the drawback, the detriment, and the issues that draw the continent behind, knowing that war is the number one, they will yeah. take a step back and say, we can do better. We can put aside our individual differences, our aspirations, or whatever gigantic things that we think that we're trying to do for our people, and look at the cost of suffering on the people and lay aside all those tendencies. Number three, what I also want to highlight from this is that Africa should understand that when there is a problem, you look at the root causes of that problem in order to resolve problems. Number four, when I look at this, it tells me that when you have the political goodwill from the powers that be, almost 99% of problems in Africa can be resolved. It's not just war, it's poverty, it's economic issues, it's corruption, it's whatever it is. If you do not have a leader that has the aspiration of the people, that has the political goodwill to resolve this problem, we will be talking about the same issues for centuries. But if we have leaders that have the people at heart, that have the political goodwill, remember, this initiative is not just the initiative of the rebels, it's the initiative from Prime Minister Abiy. He had the knife and the yam to fight this war to the end. But he looked at the suffering of his people and said, we can do something better. We can put down our soldiers. We can lower our ego and come to a discussion, to a negotiation table. That is what I want other African leaders to take from this. Look at the suffering of the people. What you are fighting for, what are you fighting for? You're fighting for the people. If at the end of the day, you destroy all the people that you believe you're fighting for, at the end of the day, what are you loving? What are you fighting for? So that is what I want all other African countries, whether you're talking about Burkina Faso, whether you're talking about Mali, whether you're talking about the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, whether you're talking about Rwanda, the eastern part of Rwanda, whether you're talking about Uganda, wherever the child, wherever there are conflicts and problems, leaders, put down your ego. Ask yourself the question. At the end of the day, when you have fought this war and you have killed everybody, what is the end result of it? And then you have the mindset to say, we can come to a discussion, we can come to a negotiating table and resolve this issue. And number six, very, very important, that I want to mention, so that if your leaders are listening to me, whether they are Francophones or Anglophones, they take this to heart. If you look at how this war started, it started because the prime minister made a tactical error, trying to take away the autonomy from a people that have earlier enjoyed regional autonomy, and that war erected. It is true that the first bullet was shot by the Tigri uh, People Liberation Front, but the cause of it is the fact that Prime Minister Abiy made a mistake and wanted to take away autonomy from a region that has enjoyed autonomy for decades. But thank God he's coming to himself and said, what are we fighting for? I'm putting together this peace accord. But again, like that reporter said, the devil is in the details. The devil is in the details. When they will start ironing out all the contours of that argument and going into the details of what each party wants to see, I hope and I pray that we are not back here talking about this war again. So that is the first impression that I have about this. Important, putting uh, the people first as uh, as a leader uh, to ensure uh, that uh, uh, we have a peaceful environment, of course, and enjoy uh, the glories of uh, their country. And of course, coming to you uh, in Ghana, Mr. Salifu Ali, uh, we know that uh, uh, when Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power, he he actually was applauded across Africa and uh, beyond. And then today we are seeing again 
then uh, this milestone uh, uh, of a peace deal between the, the government of Ethiopia uh, and the uh, uh, Tigrayan forces. What is your opinion about this? How did you welcome the news of uh, the, the signing of this uh, peace deal or the ceasefire by the warring parties uh, in Ethiopia? As um, uh, Elijah has said, I can't miss words but to join him to say that mm -hmm. this is really a very important milestone for the peace of, you know, Ethiopia. And again, we cannot, you know, escape to commend um, His Excellency, Olusegun um, Gunobasenjo, the High Envoy to, you know, the Horn of Africa, together with um, former President of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, and also the former Deputy President of what they call the South Africa, his Excellency uh, Mlamba. Now, you understand that for peace to prevail, and for that matter, when it comes to negotiations, you know, the caliber of negotiators would en engender peace among the warring factions. And if the caliber of the negotiators does not enjoin peace among the warring factions, you're not going to have their cooperation. And so, for the team that was composed, please, uh, I will uh, call on Sorry, those who are part of this your... Zoom who are not participants. Please mute your mics or you better leave uh, uh, the meeting because uh, this is uh, a, a very serious uh, program that we are discussing, uh, looking at how we can bring solutions to the problems uh, faced by the African continent. And of course, uh, uh, it would not be good if we have such interruptions from you people. Uh, please, can you continue with your, your uh, contribution, Mr. Ali? Thank you very much. Yes, so I was laying the foundation that, yes, it's very important and, you know, the biggest milestone has been crossed, which is the ceasefire. But I believe that the ceasefire is just the beginning, you know, of sustained peace. And I was sending commendations to His uh, Excellency, former President of uh, Nigeria, His Excellency Olusegun Obasanjo, who is the High Envoy to the Horn of Africa, together with Uhuru Kenyatta and also the former deputy president of South Africa. Now, you made an important you know, point when you said that um, at the start of his presidency or his pre premiership, uh, Ahmed Abe you know, was lauded and applauded across you know, the Eastern Africa region. And then today, uh, Wednesday, we had the ceasefire broken, and again, he has been you know, celebrated. Now, you would understand that, you know, given the useful nature of Ahmed Abe, he's very concerned about, you know, development in Utopia and for that matter, the home. And so he's very influential and he has put himself forward to ensure that that peace is broken so that development can triumph. Um, for us developers, we always say that without peace, nothing can triumph. And so peace is a very important milestone for everything, you know, to function. And so today, I think the whole of Africa joined Ethiopia to celebrate their commitment to peace for the development of Ethiopia. As you said earlier, African uh, solutions for African problems. Nobody can do it for us if we don't commit to do it ourselves. And so for me, you know, the fact that the warring factions have agreed to come to one table and to say that, hey, let's cease fire and to commit the development of our people. I think that is a very important milestone and we should celebrate it. But again, to emphasize that the signing of the ceasefire is just, you know, a minute aspect of sustaining the peace. There are a whole lot of things that have to be done to ensure that peace prevails and normalcy returns for development, you know, to pick up. Hello, Clarice. 
Thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Mr. Salifu Ali. Uh, just a reminder, uh, those of you joining us, that this is the Views on the Continent uh, on your Pan-African <coughs> Television, Afric Media, and we are analyzing uh, uh, the development in Ethiopia following the signing of a peace deal or a ceasefire by warring parties, that is the federal government of Ethiopia and uh, the leaders of the Tigray region. Uh, we continue in uh, that perspective, uh, Mr. Elijah uh, Inwaku, uh, the, the uh, problem for today of course is how this peace can be sustainable of course it, it takes more than signing a truce to see that lasting peace returns to the country would we'll take an example of uh, a country like South Sudan uh, we can actually uh, see that the country has been signing peace deal but then infighting hasn't stopped so how can the, the situation in Ethiopia be different? What do you think can ensure the sustainability of this peace deal or this ceasefire? Mr. Elijah Inwaku. Uh, okay. Uh, why he's coming back let's uh, invite you to listen now uh, to uh, prime minister abi ahmed uh, he spoke proud to the meeting in uh, uh johannesburg and he actually underlined the importance of uh, this uh, peace center for peace to reign for a country to attend the mission uh, the vision set aside there is need for for peace to prevail i'll invite you to listen to abi ahmed and i'll join you after that Peace is a foundation for uh, prosperity. Peace is a foundation for a country which is aspiring to, to produce inner food, to, to secure uh, full sufficiency in, in, uh, in a country. Without peace, there is no way that we can realize our vision. So we are uh, working towards peace. We are trying to convince uh, TPLF to respect the law of the land, to respect the constitution, and to, to act as um, one state in Ethiopia, if they could understand our interest, if they could uh, believe their own constitution and work accordingly, I think uh, peace will be achieved. Of course, if there are lots of intervention from left and right, sometimes it's very difficult. So Ethiopians should understand we can solve our own issue by ourselves. And instead of listening from far, better to respect our own law, better to respect our own culture, better to respect our own customary. If we could do that, peace is achievable. I hope uh, we'll achieve that. Currently in the cities that we uh, control, like Shuri, Aksum, and Adwa, we're providing uh, humanitarian aid. We'll continue to pro provide them the necessary services in our capacity, the federal government in all our capacity, it's our minimum responsibility to assist and to, pro to provide services for our uh, citizens, including Tigray. So we are, we are trying all our best to do that. I think we will achieve minimum responsibility to assist and to, pro to provide services for our uh, citizens, including Tigray. So we are, we are trying all our best to do that. I think. We will achieve that. Indeed, uh, they will achieve uh, that. Uh, and that was uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed uh, of uh, Ethiopia uh, being optimistic about finding a lasting uh, solution to the squabbles or the problems uh, that are faced uh, by the uh, the country uh, brought about by the fighting uh, between uh, the government forces and the Tigrayan uh, forces. Uh, uh, if Mr. Elijah Enoko has uh, rejoined, uh, I will direct uh, this question. We are looking at what can sustain or make this peace or uh, ceasefire sustainable. If he's not yet there, we continue with you, Mr. Uh, Salifu Ali. Uh, what do you think, in your own uh, opinion, can sustain this peace deal? Okay, so for us to go into that discussion, I, need, I think that we need to put the whole um, conflict, the genesis of it, and how far we've come in perspective. Um, as you mentioned earlier in your intro, you find that this conflict has traveled almost two years, starting from November 2022. 
you know, and we know that the two factions involved in this conflict is the government, um, what do you call it, troops, and then the TPLA, which is the Tigray People's um, Liberation Guard Front. Now, you would find that the Tigray, uh, Tigray uh, People's Liberation Front is at the northernmost of um, Ethiopia. And this is a region or a state within, you know, Ethiopia. So for that matter, it's not as safe to say that it's a different country. Now, what brought about this, you know, conflict? It is when the people asserted, you know, to go independent, to have their sovereignty. This is the whole genesis of it. Now, if this is the case, then it means that there are vested interests. It's because the vested interests have not been properly addressed. That's what has escalated into what? The full-blown conflict. Now, it means that there are underlying currents. Now, if there are underlying currents and those are not completely ironed out, you know, you cannot have sustainability. And that's why we said from the onset that, you know, we are happy that an African solution is being found to an African problem. And for that matter, the warring factions have agreed to come to the same table and to judge or and say that, okay, this is really the issue that has led us to this. And you find that in negotiations, you know, the parties agree between themselves to give and then also to receive back in certain quantities some of the interest that they will be seeding. So for me, the starting point, which we have already crossed, which is the ceasefire, you know, would have to continue with an organized or orderly disarmament. If there's no disarmament, you find that the warring factions have already been radicalized, even though at the leadership front, we've agreed to cease fire. You have to orderly, and I'm stressing on the word orderly, disarm the warring factions. Moving from there also, you have to restore law and order after you have disarmed. Because if you disarm the people and there's no law and order, the tendencies are that, you know, things would what de-escalate. Then again, there's also the need to ensure that there's restoration of institutions. The institutions that are working, law enforcement institutions, you know, governance institution, political groupings, all of these institutions have to be put back on a good state to ensure that the observe rule of law. Then again, you also have to ensure that there's adequacy or there's access of humanitarian services. Now, you agree that a war that has traveled almost two years or more has done a lot of devastation in terms of livelihoods. You know, shelter, economic um, uh, activities have been affected. People have lost their homes. Some have migrated or have exodus the region. All of these things have to be attended to, which is why we made the point earlier that the ceasefire is just really a chip of an iceberg. It's just the beginning of the whole process of sustaining peace because um, peace building is a process. It's not an event that um, at the point of signing a ceasefire or reaching a, cease, uh, a ceasefire agreement, then you say that, okay, peace has restored. No, it is actually the beginning, you know, and the things that I've outlined will really have to be looked at to ensure that we have peace returning to the home of uh, Africa. Uh, if uh, Mr. Elijah Enoko has rejoined, I would love to continue in the same light, uh, uh, bringing to you the same question, the sustainability of the peace in Ethiopia. I made mention of a country uh, like uh, South uh, Sudan, uh, where we witnessed uh, the signing of uh, many peace deals, but then uh, uh, the implementation uh, or the, uh, the real practicality uh, uh, was still a problem. But then, how can Ethiopia be a, a different and how can Ethiopia make a, a different by ensuring that this peace is sustainable and of course the 
the country will continue to 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 to, to fine tune or to redefine its economic trajectory it should be known uh, that uh, uh, the aspiration or uh, one of the aspirations of prime minister abi ahmed is to see uh, ethiopia being uh, uh, the first aviation destination in africa so how can this peace uh, be sustained so that they can fast track this development can you hear me i can hear you sir good um okay i was just going on um a few things that i wanted to mention here uh, clarice i can hear you mr elijah go ahead with your okay good good, good. please can you please um, uh, activate your video my video is oh sorry about that sorry yes about that. we are good we are good okay so as i was yes. saying um When you want to resolve a problem, the number one thing you want to look at the root causes. So my advice to the Ethiopian government, to Prime Minister Ab, is to look at the root causes. Because we've seen a lot of cases all over Africa and all over the world where similar things happen, where they've signed a peace agreement or a ceasefire. And within a couple of days, a couple of weeks, we realize that. Tensions start erupting again because the root causes of the problem were not addressed. So, first and foremost, you realize that Ethiopia was one of the fastest growing countries in the Horn of Africa and almost all of Africa. You had most of the international organizations having the headquarters in Ethiopia, not to talk about Ethiopian Airways that was fast becoming an ideal for almost every African that wants to travel back home from the West. Not only that, if you look at the GDP of Ethiopia, it was competing. I said competing. The records are there. You can go to the United Nations Development Index Office and look at those records. They were competing with Western countries when it came to the GDP of Ethiopia. Not only that, when Abi took power, he got a Nobel Peace Prize because of the peace that he brokered between Ethiopia and their the neighbors, the issue that they've been fighting over. Now, he should use the same strategy and look at this peace deal and not just say, okay, the rebels have accepted to disarm. Disarming is one thing. It's not the peace solution of the problem. It's good that they have come to the table to disarm. But the root cause of this problem is that Prime Minister Abiy, as I said from the beginning, made a mistake, decided to take away regional autonomy from a region that has enjoyed this autonomy for donkeys of years. It is true that they were the first to fire. They took, it took the base in, uh, in Tigree, and the government retaliated and then came in, and then it became a full-fledged war. The second thing is the influence of Eritrea in Ethiopia. If you look at this war, this war is not just being fought by the Ethiopian uh, military. The Eritrean government and the Eritrean military has come in and pummeling the Tigri from the north. So the position and the influence of Tigri has to be looked into because if you look at the TPLA, then one of their complaints was that a region should withdraw their forces from Tigri. So Prime Minister Abi should look at the influence of regional, you know, regional countries or neighboring countries and make sure that they are not meddling into the affairs of Ethiopia. It is true that they were meddling to the benefit of Abi's um, national uh, I mean, uh, army. But again, what happens when this peace agreement is signed and the rebels start disarming? What will be the position of the Eritrean forces that are currently in Tigri as we speak? What will be their position? Are they going to withdraw and not cause provocation or not? So this peace agreement, just like um, former President Basin just said, it, it's not the end. Signing the disagreement is not the end. The devil is in the details. The prime minister and the people of Ethiopia look are looking for peace. But let the prime minister go beyond, you know, saying, looking at what the rebels have signed and say they're going to sign. And then not only that, they've accepted that they're going to integrate into the army, into the conventional army of Ethiopia, which is good and fine. But the sentiments of what happened originally still remains. So again, the devil is in the details. Let the prime minister go beyond 
water design with the goodwill that he has to make sure that the 90% of people that are suffering integrity, 90% of people do not have access to food and nutrition. That's a lot of suffering. Not only that, the economy of Ethiopia has collapsed because of this war. We are talking about an economy whose GDP was way beyond some of the Western countries that we know today, but it has collapsed because of this war. Not only that, Ethiopia was becoming the home of technology in Africa. All Microsoft was thinking about going. Google was thinking about going. Apple was thinking about going. Now they are in, 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 uh, in Kenya. They have their headquarters in Kenya. But Ethiopia was their main target at the beginning. Not only that, telecommunication giants that want to station in Ethiopia are afraid of the consequences of this war. So Prime Minister Abiy should look at it in a way that can sustain the peace and not just saying, okay, you know, it's good. He's a young prime minister. He wants to, you know, he doesn't, he want, he's looking after his records. He doesn't want to leave power as a prime minister that, you know, decimated economy. But at the same time, fragile peace sometimes is not peace. I am happy about what is going on. It is a good sign that there's good will on both sides. But again, they should go into the nitty gritty of what entails in these agreements and make sure that they resolve it. Because as I'm telling you, looking at the agreement and looking at the communique that was signed by the uh, Degree People's Liberation Front, it shows that there are still lingering issues that have not been resolved, which Prime Minister Abiy should bring to the table. But it's a good gesture on his part that he's going so far. And if those nitty gritties are looked into, I think this is looking like it's going to be a very good sustainable peace for the people of Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa as a whole. So it's a good thing and I, we I really applaud and appreciate it. Okay, thank you indeed uh, there is need uh, to look at how uh, the other uh, 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 aspect of which we are not taught can be uh, resolved uh, internally to ensure this lasting uh, peace of course uh, uh, thank you so much mr uh, ledger uh, we continue to uh, uh, listen now uh, to the viewpoint of stakeholders who participated in this um, uh, uh, keen meeting or mediation uh, efforts to see that the, the two parties in ethiopia come to a compromise and now uh, we are going to listen uh, uh, to the uh, former president of Nigeria, uh, Olusegun Obasanjo, uh, sharing his viewpoints regarding uh, the uh, uh, peace deal, the truce in uh, Ethiopia, and uh, uh, we'll continue with our analysis. Today is the beginning of a new dawn for Ethiopia, for the Horn of Africa, and indeed for Africa as a whole. Let me hasten to thank God for this new dawn. We have seen in practice and actualization what we have tried to achieve for ourselves over the years, and that is African solution for African problems. We also see in today's peace agreement signing exercise the implementation of Agenda 2063, which embodies silencing the gun in Africa. The two, part, the two parties in the Ethiopian conflict have formally agreed to the cessation of hostilities, as well as to systematic, orderly, smooth, and coordinated disarmament, restoration of law and order, restoration of services, unhindered access to humanitarian supplies, protection of civilians, especially women, children, and other vulnerable groups, among other areas of agreement. The agreement also takes care of assurance of security for all concerned within and outside Ethiopia, monitoring, supervising, verification of implementation will be carried out by the 
AU high level panel. For what you have achieved, delegates from both sides, working together among yourselves, we salute you, we commend you, and we congratulate you. Working together among yourselves. Uh, that is uh, uh, Nigerian former President Olusegun or Bassanger uh, commending the parties in uh, Ethiopia for this uh, uh, peace uh, deal, which is, of course, a great milestone uh, and, of course, brokered by the African Union. If Africa can be a peaceful continent, it will fast track its uh, uh, development uh, agenda. And, of course, uh, if uh, guns can be silenced, uh, uh, it should be noted that uh, the African Union years back uh, outline uh, this agenda saying by 2020 there should be no proliferation of uh, small arms across the continent but then how practical is that Africa still finds uh, herself trapped uh, uh, by uh, these uh, arm conflict uh, if uh, coming back to you Mr. Salifu Ali we're going to analyze uh, on uh, some aspect uh, before jo okay uh, let me continue with you mr elijah enako uh, mr uh, obasanjo uh, made mention of this very important aspect silencing the guns i would want us to dwell on it because you know that it was said that in 2020 africa should be a continent free from this circulation of arms but today yeah uh, uh, that is not possible so do you think it is really feasible Africa as a whole, or you are just talking about Ethiopia? Yeah, well, in terms of African Union, let me just say this quite clear up there. African Union is a toothless border. We all know that. It's a toothless border. They come out with all these fancy communiques that Africa should be this and this. Thing. Even this peace negotiation that we are talking about, this is not an initiative of the African Union. The African Union was only called upon to come in to act as an arbitrator. But this is not an initiative of the African Union. This is the pure initiative of Prime Minister Abiy of Ethiopia to resolve a problem that has been lingering in their country. So talking about the African Union, I see no hope in this organization with the current cream of leadership that we have in that organization. There's no hope for this kind of, because look at the whole of Africa. Look at what's happening in Africa. Look at Burkina Faso. Look at Bahamali. Look at Chad. Look at all these countries in Africa that's going to, what has the African Union do? What have they done rather? What has the African Union done? Look at the problems that are going on in some of these African, in, in, in Central African Republic. What is the role of African Union? Look at the killings that are going on in Chad. What is the role of the African Union? Look at the situation in Cameroon. What is the role of the African Union? Look at the Biafran issue. What is the role of the African Union? These are two less bold. I'm very glad with uh, uh, President Obasanjo. He's just a representative of peace, but he's not the one ruling the African Union. So African Union to me should be disbanded. Honestly, the current claim of leadership in the African Union, it's of no good because they have not done anything to resolve the conflict in Africa. In fact, they are part of the problem. Like the case that is happening in Chad, we know what's happening in Chad. Fakim Mahat is one of the causes of the problem that's happening in Chad. So let's not talk about the African Union. Let's talk about presidents and people that have the people of Africa at hand, that have the goodwill of the people at hand. Those are the people we should be talking about in this program. Prime Minister Abi should be applauded for his initiative. He had the night and the year to go all the way, to fight this war all the way. But he decided, remember, we're talking about a tiny fraction. The Tigray Republic people is in the north. There's a tiny fraction. He had the knife, he has the army, he has the gun, he had everything to fight this war to an end. But what did he do? He looked at the suffering of his people. He looked at the deterioration of the economic situation in Ethiopia. He looked at what the crushing effect of this war is going to have on his people and he said, you know what? This is not worth fighting. Let's come to a negotiating table. I will make some concessions. The rebels will make some concessions. And we will have peace. That is what Africa is lacking. 
Look at your own country, for example. You're in Cameroon. The government of your country says that they're going to fight the war till the end. Is that what a government, a president, a leadership of a country is supposed to do? Instead of calling the powers that be to a negotiating table, to a discussion table and say, let's see how we can resolve this issue. They say, on va les maquer. That's what we hear all the time. How long are you going to destroy the economy of the Northwest and the Southwest? How long are you going to decimate the people of the North and Southwest? How long are you going to keep the people in perpetual suffering because you do not want to negotiate with the rebels and the people that be so that there's peace in the country? That is what we are lacking in Africa. That's what we are lacking in most parts of Africa. The powers that be are not willing to come to a negotiation table to discuss peace with the rebels. We could call them all sorts of names. We could call them rebels. We could call them terrorists. We could call them whatever we want. But at the end of the day, we are going to sit on the negotiating table with those people in order to stop the guns from blazing. It is not speeches that the African Union is going to say, we hope by 2020, guns are going to stop blazing. No, it is conscious conflict resolution effort that is put in place by the African Union with the warring parties. It doesn't matter what name you call those warring parties. Call them terrorists. Call them uh, hoodlums. Call them whatever it is. At the end of the day, you are going to sit on a negotiating table with these people to talk peace. That is what Africa needs. Peace. Thank you, uh, Mr. Elijah. And those of you just joining us, you're welcome. This is Fuse <coughs> on the continent. Uh, uh, Sally for Ali, uh, we continue uh, uh, listening to Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. He made a uh, mention of what aspect that I would love us to dwell on. He, he pointed out that uh, while uh, on the negotiating about uh, uh, ending the, the, the fighting in Ethiopia, he made mention of too much foreign interference and i quite remember that some years ago he said that there was conquest and militarism uh, across africa and governments needs to to be very careful as uh, in the quest to carve a sphere of influence uh, there is uh, this uh, militarism uh, that is on the rise and he talks of this foreign inter interference so uh, how can we analyze this and how can africa avoid uh, the the, the middling or the disrespect Respect of the sovereign state across the continent. Thank you very much. And you find that at the core or the root cause of all these is underlying economic factors that are internal to every country. I've said on a different platform that if Africa doesn't, you know, collaborate between and amongst ourselves, and for that matter, promote gainful economic activities between ourselves, what would happen is that arms would find their ways across our borders. And it's very easy. You know, so once arms take the order of the day and they are easily able to cross the borders in sort of goods and services or personnel, you know, moving inside and outside of our borders and promoting economic activities, what we will have is conflicts all over. You know, because then you are not taking advantage of, you know, your proximity to trade or to exchange goods and services amongst yourself. You are allowing um, arms to take the space of goods and services. And we know what arms can do, especially when it gets into the wrong hands, who are ill-motivated for whatever reason. I think that this is what is upon Africa. And, you know, the example that we're seeing in the Horn of Africa. Blame it on the people, but also you have to blame it on our leadership and the consciousness that we need to be able to make sure that we guard against this. If we sit aloof and think that this will fall in place, it will not. Today, you are in a globalized world. You know, there's liberalization. So people are free to move about, you know, carry all sorts of things. But if we streamline it and make sure that we channel it towards gainful economic what, uh, venture, then we're able to control it and the narrative would be ours, you see. But if that is not done, you know, the cases of what you call Ethiopia, Uganda, Rwanda, and the rest of them would continue to read their ugly heads. 
Now, again, Africa has to be in charge in terms of our leadership. What Africa do we want to grow? Again, Elijah mentioned, it starts from that consciousness and that deliberate act, you know, of what we want to see or what we want our Africa to be. And then gradually we begin to grow towards that. If we don't direct the narrative, we don't take, you know, center stage in driving the Africa that we want, you know, that is how our however need uh, to strategize and actually have uh, the Africa uh, that we want uh, bringing African uh, pro uh, solutions to African uh, problems. Uh, we continue, uh, Mr. Uh, Elijah Enoko. We are looking at this uh, issue of foreign interference. When the Prime Minister talks of foreign interference, who do you think or what do you think he means by that? Uh, it should be noted uh, that uh, some reports uh, actually are viewed that uh, the, uh, the the United uh, uh, States of America or the U.S. government uh, was literally against uh, the, the government of of uh, Prime Minister Abiy and Maid, and he we see him today making this uh, statement. Can that be a link uh, to the, uh, the the two, or is just an independent uh, statement that needs uh, to be given uh, a, a greater analysis? Mr. Elijah Inwaku. Yeah, can you hear me? I guess you can hear me, right? Please, yeah. we're listening okay. to you. Good, good. Um, I want to first of all come back a little bit to something that you asked there about Prime Minister Abi complaining about foreign influence. But that's hypocrisy. I love his, you know, his aspiration for his people, but we have to be honest at the same time. Who brought in foreign forces? He brought in Ethiopian uh, forces to fight on Ethiopian soil. That is foreign influence right there. So let us, he, he, he can't have it both ways. But we know what war is. When there is war, everybody wants to try to play to the gallery and, uh, you know, play his own part and try to make the, the opening look bad. But again, let's put it this way. If there is a problem in your family and you do not open the door to third parties. Third parties are not going to come in, whether it's in a family or it's in marriage or in relationship or whatever it is. If you do not open the door to third parties, they're not going to come in. Immediately you open the doors to third parties, they are going to come in with their interest. America has its interest. As we are speaking, where did the, if you, I mean, uh, the, 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 the Russian uh, foreign minister visit? You understand where they are going. They're going all over Africa, Ethiopia, uh, 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 um, um, Egypt, the visited all these other countries. They have their own interests. But if we do not open the door to those foreign powers, if Africa is going to take leadership and take you know, the, the direction of their own continent apart and have their own aspiration there and not open the door to these foreign powers, they will not come in. Foreign powers only you know, exploit African weaknesses. That is what they do at best. They exploit our weaknesses to come in. When this war started, every country was taking sides. America said, okay, we know the root cause of this problem. It is because you, Prime Minister Abi, you have taken away the autonomy of a region that has always experienced regional autonomy. Could you please negotiate with these people? Abi cried foul. He said, oh, Americans are coming. They are taking sides with degree. But who opened the door? He opened the door for these foreign powers to come in. Russia was looking for influence as we speak. They were looking for influence to come in to supply arms and weapons to the Ethiopian government. But the Ethiopian government, they, they were smart. They saw that Russia had their own interests at the same time. That's why Abi said, do I deal now with the Americans or do I deal with the Russians? But he was a smart guy. You saw that they have their own interests of coming in to supply arms he quickly filed in for a peace with the rebels. That is where I salute him. That is where I salute him. But in terms of crying foul that foreign powers are coming, he opened the door. He opened the door to those foreign powers. So let's call a spade a spade. Why we are congratulating him for what he has done, but he has also blundered along the way. This war wouldn't have happened 
if he did not retaliate against the Tigri people, if he did not take away the autonomy that this region has been enjoying for a very long time, that's where the problem started. That's the root cause of the problem. So foreign powers only come in to exploit our, I mean, our weaknesses as Africans. As long as Africans have their own solution to their own problem and with their own people, not jetting all over the world to go and resolve problems in Berlin or in France or in the United States or in DC, we will have African solutions to African problems and we will not be talking about foreign influence anymore. Thank you. Of course, I uh, always say that uh, we have the right to uh, opinions. And uh, uh, coming back to you, uh, uh, you were inter uh, interrupted uh, while talking. Uh, but then let, let me give you this question, Mr. Uh, Salifo Alia. Uh, uh, somebody uh, who is a geopolitical uh, analyst uh, made mention of the fact that, of course, it is uh, easy to sign, it is easy to ink uh, a truce or a peace deal, but then the, it's very critical and very uh, difficult to achieve. Do you think uh, there is this, this statement carries veracity, uh, given that the two parties are concert, uh, have concerted and they are ready to fight uh, uh, to ensure that peace returns to the uh, country? Two years of fighting has only brought uh, a mayhem or misery uh, to the millions of uh, Ethiopians that we see this uh, displaced and those that have lost their lives due to the infighting. Well, I want to look at the positive side of it. You know, um, the the war is a form of communication. You know, we say that in human endeavor, war is inevitable. But the kind of war that, you know, brings about untold mayhem is really not desired. I mean, that's not the kind of war that we are looking at for. But at any moment that people disagree, it means that there's something going on that, you know, one party or the other is not comfortable with. And that's a form of communication. And you need to come back to the table to what to try to resolve it. Now, with commitment, they say that where there is a will, you know, there's a way. Um, if the parties are committed to lasting peace, I think that that would happen. It is when they are not committed to it that it will not happen. We've said it over and over that peace building is a conscious, long, painful process. You see, so if the parties have come to realize that where we've gotten to, you know, going on with this war, when we really are neighbors or brothers and sisters, it's not helpful to the development of our people. So at this point, let all bygones be bygones. Let's sit at the table and really go to the root cause of this problem, as Elijah said you know, earlier. What is the root cause of this problem? Tigray says that at this point, we feel that we want to assert our sovereignty. We want to be independent. And Ethiopia is saying that traditionally, you know, Tigray is just a state within Ethiopia. And so we are not going to allow you to seed from what Ethiopia. I think this has been the genesis of it. Now, be that as it may, you know, fast forward, we've gotten to the point where the two, you know, sides have realized that no, we really should not be engaged in this. And for the first step to demonstrate to the world and to their people who are suffering, and we know today that millions of people have lost their homes. You know, there's no uh, humanitarian access to even provide the basic necessities of life to the people of what of degree that is really not a good story now at the back of this the leadership have agreed that no let's come to the table and make sure that this thing is a thing of the past and for me for me that sign alone you know is great enough for us to be sure and positive that the people of ethiopia and degree are capable of ensuring lasting you know peace for the development of their people. So it is possible to do it where the commitment is. And I believe that at this point, you know, they, they are committed to ensuring that there is peace for development. 
development uh, uh, almost culminating the 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 program uh, one last uh, word from you mr elijah enwaku as uh, the parties in uh, ethiopia uh, look forward to implementing uh, their resolutions of uh, uh, arif ada in uh, uh, johannesburg south africa uh, that led to the signing of this peace deal Clarice, I want to use this opportunity to speak to all African countries that are going through conflicts. I want to use this occasion to speak to the minds of Africans. And I want to give an example why speaking about this, because as an African who is living out here in the diaspora, with the potential that we have as Africans, with the enormous resources that we have as Africans, whether it is natural resource, human resource, human capital, the technical know-how, the brain, the young population that is burning out there. I want to give this to Africans. You are not going to shoot your way to peace. It doesn't matter how mighty you are as a government. You are not going to shoot your way to peace. The mighty United States could not shoot its way to peace in Vietnam with all the gigantic weapons that they had. You do not kill an ideology with the battle of the gun. You kill an ideology with a counter ideology that is superior to the ideology that the people with the gun are fighting. Whether you are talking about Cameroon or Burkina Faso or Mali, go to the negotiating table. I'll give you this example, and I've given it on different platforms where I've been invited to speak. There was a situation in Mali where the Malian government was seeking a way for humanitarian corridor in the northern part of the country where the people that are fighting, whether they call them terrorists or whatever it is, that's not what matters here. It's, they were looking for a way for a humanitarian corridor to supply food to the, to the part of the country that were trapped. The person that succeeded to make a truce with the rebels or who they call terrorists is the powerful imam of Bamako. He was able to negotiate with the people that are calling terrorists in the north, and these people laid down their arms and they were able to usher in a humanitarian corridor to the northern part of Mali. That is an example that even though the people in the northern part of Mali are being called terrorists, they are still Malians and they are seeing the suffering of the people, they can sit on a table and discuss peace. And this can pertain to any country. In Cameroon, the people that are being called terrorists, they are Cameroonians as well. People can sit on a negotiating table and discuss peace, just as Ethiopians have done. In Burkina Faso, it's the same thing. In Chad, it's the same thing. In Central African Republic, it's the same thing. Peace is being can be discussed on a negotiating table. You are not going to get peace through the battle of the gun. That is my last word. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Elijah Enwaku, for being there with us. Uh, Say so you're a researcher with Leeds University on African Development. Uh, thank you for your input on this uh, very important topic. And of course, saying thank you to for uh, uh, to Mr. Uh, Salifu Ali, who joined us uh, uh, from uh, Ghana in his capacity as uh, Executive uh, Director for Center Africa. Center for Development and Social Innovations. Uh, thank you so much for your great insight on this. Uh, hoping that in the months ahead, the parties in Ethiopia will continue to uh, implement the resolution of the peace deal to have a lasting peace in their country. And peace is what they need. Peace is what Africa needs. Uh, while talking the technical crew for a successful uh, run of the program, we also take this opportunity to apologize for the interruptions but then uh, don't go away keep trusting the pan-african television for news is always on the move thank you and have a lovely weekend you will meet uh, rita uh, motosone tomorrow in the pan-african debate talking still about issues affecting africa and the global world bye <music>